All right. Hello, everybody. Is this on? Can you guys hear me from the back? Great. Wonderful. No, don't mute it. That's not a good thing. OK. Uh, well, welcome, everybody. Uh, my name is Tyler McMacken, and I am representing CU Prime for our second annual physics debate. This year, we get to talk about dark matter. So uh, I'm excited. Hope you guys are excited. We have two professors here. Professor Kevin Stenson is on my right, and Professor Jeremy Darling is on my left. And they are experts in their field. Yes. <laughs> Great. And I'll give them more complete interjections in a second. Uh, just a few things to make you aware of. If you do not know what CU Prime is, uh, CU Prime is a student organization on campus that is devoted to increasing equity, inclusion, and diversity in the physics department and beyond. And so we have a number of different programs. A mentorship program, which is on hiatus this semester, but we have a series of talks that are given by researchers, mostly graduate students. The first of those talks is going to be two weeks from tomorrow. Uh, they're usually up in the 11th floor of the Gamow Tower. And we also have weekly coffee hour uh, on Mondays that you are free to come to if you want to chat, uh, have some social time, or just grab some cookies and leave. And we also host a student taught class that is offered every fall semester. Uh, and so I encourage you to check out more things or talk to uh, anybody who's representing CU Prime here if you want more details about that. So the uh, format of tonight's event is the following. And uh, Professor Ethan Neal is going to give uh, more of an overview of this format. So I'll just briefly run through. Right now, we're in the introduction stage. In a second, we're going to hear the opening statements from both the speakers. Then they're going to give their rebuttals. And then uh, we'll leave basically the second half of the night so that you guys can ask questions and bombard them with all the things that they probably don't have answers to. Great. OK, now we need to come up with a winner for tonight's event because we have prizes. And the way that we're going to do that is with this survey. So if you have your phones, uh, please scan that QR code. And it should open a Google form. If you do not have access to Wi-Fi, we do have uh, paper copies. Um, you can grab those up at the back on either side. Or um, they might be floating around somewhere else. But the important thing about this is that you guys all come in with your own preconceived notions of what you think the answer is, what dark matter is. And so we don't want to just ask you at the end what you think it is. Instead, uh, we're going to ask you at the beginning. And then at the end, we'll ask you the same question again. What is dark matter made of? And then we'll measure what, uh, who had who swayed more people, essentially. So if more people converted to one side or the other, then we'll declare that as a win for that side. And uh, we have prizes. Uh, the main prize for the winner, uh, Luke, one of our organizers, did a wonderful job of discovering dark matter. <laughs> he found a piece of it somewhere in Boulder, and here it is. Uh, so we don't know what it is. Maybe the, the winner of tonight's debate can examine it in detail with their physics knowledge. Uh, but we also wanted a prize for the loser, because nobody is going to go away empty-handed. And we thought, what better for a prize than astrophysics for babies? <laughs> because they will apparently be needing it. All right, so hopefully everybody has gotten a chance to scan this QR code and answer that first question of what you think dark matter is. Uh, so keep that form open. Do not submit it yet, or else we'll throw away your response. And then once we get to the end of the debate, then you can answer that question again and submit the form. Does that make sense? OK, wonderful. So we need to figure out uh, who goes first in a traditional debate um, we would have a question that has a yes or no answer, and then we would assign uh, one person to the, the yes and the no, and then the person who answers the affirmative would give the first opening statement. We don't quite have that format, because in physics, things aren't quite as clean as that. There are many different models of dark matter that we might be discussing. And so instead, uh, we decided to decide who goes first in a slightly different way. Uh, anybody who went to last year's debate might remember it was on quantum measurement interpretations of quantum mechanics. And we made a quantum measurement to basically flip a coin and make a truly random 
measurement. Uh, we thought of doing something similar, but maybe to do with dark matter, and then we realized nobody's actually detected dark matter. And this is something that both of you guys are going to have to answer to, because I'm very angry to find this out. Uh, so instead, we decided to play a little game with the two speakers. I created two images. One of them is from a space telescope that is relevant to the study of dark matter, and the other is from Google Street View. And their job was to figure out which was which. So in this case, the one on the left is from JWST. It's one of these weird early galaxies, which might be a star fueled by dark matter. And the other one, I don't know what's going on there. OK, so we gave them three pairs of images to see who goes first. This is the first pair. One of these is from a space telescope, and the other is from Google Street View. And if you look closely at the one on the left, you might notice it kind of looks like letters at CVS. <laughs> and the one on the right is the bullet cluster, which we'll probably hear more about today. So how did they do? They both got it wrong. <laughs> OK, so we need another one. Here's the second one. Again, one of these is from a space telescope. One of them is taken on Earth. Well, I guess they're both taken near Earth. Um, this one on the left is from a space telescope. And one on the right is a UFO. <laughs> OK, and how did they do? They both got it right. So. It all comes down to the last photo. One of these is from a space telescope, and one of these is from Google Street View. The one on the left is the cosmic microwave background. And the one on the right is some flowers above a pair of pants. OK. <laughs> now, how do they do? Professor Stenson got that one right. And Professor Darling did not. So that means that we have our first speaker is going to be Professor Stenson. All right. Now, let me introduce the speakers. Uh, and then I'll hand things over to our debate moderator, Ethan Neal. So first up, we have Professor Kevin Stenson. He, I guess they're both avid skiers. Uh, professor Stenson is a professor of physics at the University of Colorado Boulder, and he's also the associate chair for graduate studies in the Department of Physics. He earned his PhD at the turn of the century, around there, from the University of Wisconsin-Madison in collaboration with work that he did at Fermilab, where he took up quarks and down quarks and smashed them into a diamond to try to see if he can make charm quarks. And it turns out that he could. Um, and it fit theory well. And so after that, he, after a brief stint as a professor at Vanderbilt, he landed at CU Boulder in 2003 and has been here ever since. Uh, so Stenson is an expert in everything related to the Large Hadron Collider. He works with the CMS experiment at CERN, searching for supersymmetry. And if you don't know what CERN is, it's another one of these large experiments that smashes things together. And Apparently, they get to very high energies, up to 13 tera electron volts of energy. If you don't know how much that is, it is about the same as the kinetic energy of a flying mosquito. It's a lot. OK. 13.6. All right. There you go. That's 14. Apparently, it makes a big difference. All right, uh, and then on my left, we have Professor Jeremy Darling. He's a professor of astrophysics at CU Boulder, and he's also the director of CASA, the Center for Astrophysics and Space Astronomy. He earned his PhD in 2002 at, in astrophysics at Cornell University, studying OH mega masers uh, using the largest, at the time, uh, single-dish space telescope that we have, the Arecibo Observatory. Uh, if you don't know what mega masers are, they're pretty cool. They're like lasers, but in space, and a lot bigger, and with wavelengths that are a lot larger than the traditional lasers that we have on Earth. If you want to know how large they are, it's about the same size as the wavelength of sound produced by a mosquito. 
Uh, after earning his PhD, uh, Professor Darling earned a Carnegie Fellow and became a Barbara, Barbara McClintock Fellow until he landed a Hubble Fellow here at CU Boulder, starting in 2005 until the present uh, he remained where he is now. Uh, Professor Darling studies everything astrophysics from gravitational lensing to cosmology, galactic evolution, black holes, and relevant to this debate, axionic detection from magnetars. All right, so those are our two speakers. And moderating tonight's debate is Professor Ethan Neal. He's an associate professor of physics at CU Boulder in the theoretical particle physics group. Uh, he earned his PhD in 2011 from physics from Yale University, and he studies lattice field theory, uh, and he works with physicists at Fermilab to study composite models of dark matter. All right, let's give it a hand for our three speakers, and I'll hand things over to Ethan Neal. All right, great. Well, before I get started, let me, let me first start by... Uh, saying just a big, big thank you to Tyler, to everyone involved with CU Prime, not only for organizing this, this fantastic, fun event, but for everything they do around the department. Uh, it's amazing. I wish there had been a, a CU Prime equivalent when I was an undergrad physics student. So uh, I want to give a big round of applause to Tyler and, and CU Prime. All right, and so before we get into the debate, my job is to sort of give you a little bit of a, uh, an overview uh, of what we do know about dark matter. Uh, as Tyler said, I do a little bit of work on models that are neither WIMPs nor axions, so I guess I'm sufficiently neutral to moderate this debate for the evening. So uh, the question of the evening is, what is dark matter? And that's a very open question, uh, hence the debate. Uh, but there are some things that we do know about dark matter, right? So despite uh, Tyler being angry that we haven't actually found it yet in experiments, uh, there is a lot of good news. There are things we do know about dark matter. And my main job here is to tell you about some of those things. Uh, so the first thing we know is that dark matter gravitates. Uh, we see its gravitational effects directly acting on other things. Uh, and I'm gonna, that's going to be the main uh, sort of thing I'm going to tell you about in detail. The second thing we know is that there is a lot of it. There's about a 5 to 1 ratio of the amount of dark matter in the total universe to the amount of ordinary visible matter at least when we total everything up. Third thing we know is that dark matter, to at least a very good approximation, is cold and collisionless. And what that means is basically that it doesn't interact very strongly with itself. It doesn't move very quickly. It sort of exists in big, diffuse clumps uh, to good approximation. And again, I'll tell you a little bit more detail on that. And finally, right there in the name, dark matter is dark. What I mean by that is that any non-gravity interactions uh, with us are constrained by various observations to be very, very weak uh, indeed. So this rules out things that you might think might be candidates for dark matter, like dust asteroids, things that are sort of, sort of dark but still made of visible matter. Those still interact very strongly with uh, the rest of the visible matter out there that we do observe to the point that that's, that's not an option. It's something mysterious and new. Okay? Um, all the above evidence comes from astrophysics. We have not seen dark matter in the laboratory uh, yet, hopefully coming soon. But I just want to convince you that the astrophysical evidence we have is what tells us about all these facts about dark matter, and it is overwhelming evidence. We are, we are here to debate what is dark matter, not is there dark matter. So uh, let me start with uh, just uh, gal galactic rotation curves, as they're known. So here's a picture of a galaxy. And here's a star somewhere on the edge of the galaxy that I've picked arbitrarily. And one of the things I love about talking about dark matter to audiences like this is that you, you don't need that much physics knowledge to understand, especially this sort of crucial piece of evidence for dark matter. All you need is what you learned in intro physics. Okay? So suppose I want to study the motion uh, of that star as it moves around the, the galaxy. Well, uh, so let's say it's moving in, in a circle, basically. We have a centripetal force acting on it. Uh, and that force is equal to mv squared over r. As you remember from intro physics, and what is the source of that force? Well, the, the star is gravitationally bound to the galaxy. And to good approximation, the reason I picked one on the edge of the galaxy is that basically the whole galaxy is acting as a giant point mass, exerting its gravitational pull uh, on that star. And so that gravitational force is equal to the centripetal force. And we just equate those two things and we solve, and we find a nice simple scaling relation that if we observe a bunch of stars like this, and especially we look at them as a function of the radius, the distance to the center of the galaxy, uh, 
they should be getting slower. The motion should go down as one over the square root of r as we move further out. Okay. So that's the prediction. That's, that's theory. Theory predicts that the velocity of the stars that we observe is going to fall uh, as we get further from the center. Uh, but what do we actually see in observation? So here's the data. The little points with the uh, error bars on them are from observational data from uh, NGC 3196, so one particular galaxy. There are many, many galaxies we've observed similar things in. So the lower curve labeled disk, uh, you can see that's falling. Uh, that's the one over square root of r behavior that I predicted. Um, and you can see that does not describe the data points at all. If we want to describe the motion or the, the scaling of the velocity with radius, which is basically constant, there must be an additional component, which is the second curve labeled halo. And so to complete the description of the data, uh, we need not just the visible matter, but we need this, this sort of dark matter halo. And in particular, the fact that it's scaling constantly points to as I was saying, a big sort of diffuse cloud, much, much larger than the galaxy itself, that sort of, uh, that everything is embedded in, including these, these sort of outer stars that we were trying to observe. Yeah. So this is evidence for this big cold collisionless dark matter halo. What else can we say? Uh, so there's a, there's a really cool effect called gravitational lensing. This is one of the predictions of general relativity. Uh, and lensing lets us basically see where mass is just by looking for bending of background light, so light from things that are behind the object that we're, we're trying to see the mass of. Okay, this is one of the, the gravitational lensing of the, of the, due to the sun was one of the famous observations that, that proved general relativity. And now I want to talk about observations of things much larger than the sun. So this is a, uh, an image, uh, composite image of a galaxy cluster. Uh, everyone shows the bullet cluster. And everyone thinks uh, that's the only example because everyone always shows the bullet clusters. This is a different one, but a similar observation. And what you're seeing here is a merger of two galaxy clusters, so massive collections of galaxies. And the two things overlaid in false color are the blue blobs. Blue is the gravitational mass that comes from this gravitational lensing. Uh, so looking at the background. Uh, the pink false color is the visible matter, and that comes from the Chandra X-ray Observatory. So that's basically X-ray radiation. Uh, and that's essentially hot gas, okay? And you can see they're not quite in the same place. And the interpretation of what happened here is that when these two clusters merged with each other, all the ordinary matter, all the hot gas collided uh, and slowed down and it starts and emits x-rays. Um, the dark matter just passes right through. So it just passed through and kept going. So you can see this is sort of post-merger. There's a displacement of the actual visible mass or of the, of the mass, which we see through lensing, from the visible matter, which we see in X-rays. Yeah. So this is further evidence, not just for the presence of dark matter, but about its properties, that it's, again, it's cold and collisionless. It just passes right through itself, basically, and that it's very dark. It's, it's not being, uh, not really interacting much with the visible matter. OK, third piece of evidence. Uh, this is so-called large-scale structures. We can look even larger than galaxy clusters just to what the universe looks like on the very, very largest distance scales that we can see, uh, or in the past, which is the same thing because the speed of light is finite. Uh, and what we can do is compare observation to simulation. So the simulation is blank because there is a movie that I'm going to play now. So this is uh, a cosmology simulation. And z is redshift, so z decreasing is, without going into details, just going forward in time. And you can see things sort of coalescing into this kind of filamentary structure. Uh, which matches what you see in observations from uh, the Sloan Digital Sky Survey on the right. Okay. And to do this, so to do this massive simulation, uh, the simulations must include dark matter in the simulation or else they don't get the right answer. So it's to reproduce the structure that we see. And I'm sort of asking you to see this by eye. It, and uh, you know, the comparisons that they do using the simulations are much more quantitative than that. Uh, but nevertheless, uh, you ha must have dark matter in the simulation. You must have the right amount of it, again, 5 to 1, to ordinary matter, in order to reproduce the right large-scale structure. Yeah. Um, there are similar, similar constraints on the very largest distance scales from what's called the cosmic microwave background. Uh, if you know about those, then you know about them. I won't go into detail here. It's, it sort of gives it basically similar constraints to this. All right. So uh, despite all the evidence, we know that dark matter is there. 
Uh, we know about its uh, properties, we know it gravitates, but that really doesn't narrow things down that much. There's still a massive range of possibilities for dark matter. Um, from very, very light uh, and wave-like objects all the way up to really huge things, solar masses, multi-solar masses. Uh, this comic is on my door, this XKCD, that sort of gives you a rundown of uh, some of the more interesting possibilities, like eight balls. Uh, one of the things I like about this comic is that, uh, like most XKCDs, it's funny, but it's also accurate. So this is a real plot from a, uh, from a set of lecture notes from 2019. Uh, it was given to uh, theory grad students here at CU Boulder in a summer school. It's basically the same plot, right? In fact, the, the, XK, the XKCD cartoon was kind of conservative. It doesn't cover as wide of a mass range as the real set of possibilities that I show on the bottom. And a lot of the same sort of candidates are included in both. Yeah. So there's a wide range of possibilities for what the actual particle identity of dark matter could be. Uh, and we are searching for them. There's a wide range of experiments we can do. We'll cast a broad net with experiment, but two of the most well-motivated targets are the two that we're going to be debating tonight, WIMPs and axions. And so we have to decide which of those is more likely. Where should we be putting more of our, more of our uh, thought in, and time and effort into? So let the debate begin. All right, so again, here's the debate format, just to remind everyone. So the, the basic question is, which type of particle is more likely to be the main source of dark matter? Is it weakly interacting massive particles, uh, which is what WIMPs stand for, or is it the light and wave-like axion? So we're going to start with opening arguments, uh, 10 minutes each. We're going to have rebuttals, and then we're going to turn it to you, the audience, for Q&A uh, before we finally vote to decide who wins. So with that, uh, I'm going to turn it over to Professor uh, Kevin Stenson to defend the, uh, the case for WIMPs in the, in the blue corner, which I arbitrarily decided. <laughs> <laughs> you're, I made you blue and, uh, and Jeremy red. Okay. So. Turn this on too, in case somebody's recording. Um, so this is our uh, standard model of particle physics, which is as of. 4th of July 2012, complete as terms of the number of particles. Um, that was the discovery of the Higgs boson was the last one. So we have these quarks, we've got leptons, we've got the force mediators shown in purple, and then we got this little extra guy, the, the Higgs boson. And so those are, are the particles that exist in the standard model. And then on the right we have the forces that are understood in terms of the, the force carriers, the quantum forces. Uh, so Gravity is notably absent from the list. We exclude that from the standard model. It's so weak and we don't really understand it at the quantum level. Um, well, the string theorists might think they do. But um, anyway, the, uh, so the forces that we do understand in the, in the, at the quantum level are uh, electromagnetic force, the weak force, and the strong force. Okay, so where are we going with this? Well, we're going to WIMPs and the first WIMP stands for is an abbreviation, um, you know, probably a backronym. I'm too. I'm not. I'm not old enough to know. You know, to be to know who actually came up with this. But it stands for weakly interacting massive particles. And when it was first created, uh, the weak, the weakly part was referring specifically to, uh, whoops, the weak interaction, uh, the weak interaction here. All right. Um, and so, and then so so basically the idea was that okay, we all know that. The dark matter has to um, uh, has to act, you know, interact gravitationally. So that's a given. It interacts gravitationally. Ethan explains why how we know that's the case. Um, but the question would be, does it interact in any other way? Um, you know, that that we may, maybe allows us to find it, for instance. Um, and so the proposal was, you know, that wimps could explain the dark matter. Um, and they would be weakly interacting, and then they would be massive because one of the other requirements of uh, dark matter, um, you know, especially with a lot of the astronomical observations and this in the cosmic microwave background and so on, is that in order to get the clumpiness uh, that you wanted and some other features, you needed the um, you needed the uh, matter to be non-relativistic. So it couldn't be going too fast. If it was going too fast, that would be hot dark matter, and it doesn't it doesn't clump the right way. All right, so we need a cold dark matter. So you want massive particles that are going to be not moving around so fast. Um, and so that's the M in massive. Um, yeah, so we assume that they interact uh, 
weekly and of course uh, via gravity. So why did we invent WIMPs? Well, particle physicists love to invent new particles. I mean, it gives us something to do, all right, to look for those new particles, all right, that's, that's really the number one priority. Um, but, you know, you run into a problem, why not invent a new particle? And it's worked really well for us in the past, right? The nucleus was too light, all right? If you assumed it's just made out of protons, all right, or protons and electrons, you don't get nearly, you know, you got about half the mass that you need, right? So why not invent a neutron? We found it, all right? Um, you, you're looking at your beta decay spectrum and you're like, energy isn't conserved? People thought energy wasn't conserved. They thought that was a solution to the beta decay. Oh, no, Pauli says, why not invent a new particle? Boom, we got the neutrino, all right? Took another 30 years to find it, but it, you know, we got it there. Um, so CP violation shows up. Who ordered that, all right? Completely out of the blue. People didn't expect that to show up. Um, so we can invent a couple more quarks expand the standard model a little bit more, and CP violation is naturally allowed within the standard model once you add those two extra quarks. All right, um, you know, you've got this weak interaction. Nobody knows why it's weak. People say, oh, maybe the charge, maybe the, maybe the gauge boson, the, the, the quantum particle that's carrying that has a big mass. That would naturally make it short as opposed to long distance, all right? We knew about long distance things, gravity and Electromagnetic, those are long distance stuff that go on forever because the, the charge, the, um, the uh, thing that's carrying the force, all right, the photon for instance, is massless. All right, so you get a mass to something, it turns out to have a very short distance, that explains it. The W and Z particles are sub subsequently found. And then we needed to make electroweak theory work and some you know, very brilliant people a long time ago figured out how to make it work and it, and it uh, predicted the Higgs boson, all right, again. It took, what, 60 years uh, to find it, um, but eventually it was found. Okay, so WIMPs haven't been, you know, been predicted for 60 years yet, so, you know, we're not, we're, you know, we're, we're not quite as, you know, far along as we are in the search for the Higgs maybe, but maybe it'll be there, we'll see. Um, another reason why WIMPs were thought to be interesting is because they fit really well into this beautiful, elegant theory called supersymmetry. Um, and so this is when you start to think big. Why add just one particle when you could say that every particle that you've already seen actually has a whole nother particle? We're not talking about the antiparticle. That one exists. We're talking about a totally new particle, all right? For every particle that exists, there's a Susie particle, a Sparticle, all right, with cool names, all right? We can call them, you know, Spotum, Selectron, we know. Um, so that just seems, you know, pretty exciting. Um, and the lightest particle of supersymmetry, the lightest supersymmetric particle um, in, in most of the SUSY models that we think of can be the dark matter, all right? And so, and SUSY comes along with a whole bunch of other cool things that it solves. It explains the, what's called the hierarchy problem, why the Higgs mass is so light. It can give us, uh, give us grand unified theory a little easier. So there are cool things about supersymmetry and, and so it just seemed to work. And then there was this thing um, called the WIMP miracle. And so the question people ask is, how do you get all these wimps into the universe, all right? You know, if it's whatever, uh, you know, dominant form of matter in the universe, how do they come to exist? And there's a natural way to make them exist in that they basically were just created during the Big Bang, all right? After the Big Bang, the universe starts cooling. Wimps exist in equilibrium during this hot phase, all right? But eventually the universe cools down and, um, and, they, and they're no longer being created and annihilated, all right? They just you get, you get uh, at some freeze out temperature, you just get some leftover wimps, all right? And it turns out that there was this sort of coincidence that for the mass that you needed, all right, for the number density and the mass that you needed, your cross section, your annihilation cross section turned out to be right around where the weak interaction was. And so this is not, so this is again, this is something called the, the wimp miracle. Um, you can look it up, it really is called a miracle, all right? Um, but it, it's more of a, a coincidence, right? That, well, maybe not a coincidence, but it seemed to lead us in the right direction. Like, we already have this weak force that we know about, and if we put in this cross-section, in this mass, somehow it ends up giving us the right relic density, the current density in the universe of WIMPs, and that's amazing. So people were like, this is cool. All right, so how can we find it? Well, there are three main ways we can look for it that's shown on this diagram. We can have, Colliders collide standard model particles like 
protons, whoops, I put this in the wrong order, um, like protons make a pair of dark matter candidates, all right? So SM is standard model, DM is dark matter. Um, we can have, whoops, we can have um, direct detection where a dark matter particle scatters off a standard model particle, like a nucleus, um, or we can have indirect detection where we look in the sky, all right, for evidence of dark matter uh, particles uh, interacting, um, annihilating. So I'm on the CMS experiment, so obligatory pick here. Um, here we collide protons together. We make new matter that hasn't existed uh, before, or at least not since early in the Big Bang. Um, and so one of the things we try to do is maybe make dark matter and see if we can find it. Here's an example of a uh, direct detection experiment, the LZ experiment, where basically they've, you, you, you got your WIMP coming in, it interacts with the xenon nucleus, produces light and electrons, they collect this and try to you know, differentiate it from the background. Um, and then, I, I, I only got 20, 27 seconds according to this. So. Anyway, um, and then the last option is the, uh, indirect detection where the Fermi, there's an example here where you basically point your telescope at the center of the galaxy where you think there's a lot of dark matter um, and look for uh, annihilation signature, all right? Look for gamma rays from two dark matter particles that happen to collide, annihilate, and, and send you your signal. So what's the problem? Um, well, uh, yeah, um, we haven't seen anything, all right? There's been a lot of effort over 30 years um, and there's been a lot of limits showing us that, uh, that there's, uh, you know, that there isn't any dark, there, there aren't any wimps. So that is a concern, all right, I'll, I'll grant you. Um, but I would say the future is still, still very positive for wimps. Um, we can get away, we can get around some of the issues by, first of all, we can relax the W in weak, all right, to be just sort of any kind of interaction that isn't strong, that isn't like, a, you know, that's got a small coupling constant. Um, so why, why, why stick to just inventing a single particle when you can invent a whole new force? So one example that our group is looking at is a, is a version of, uh, the dark, of dark QCD, which could lead to like dark neutrons, all right? So instead of regular neutrons, you get dark neutrons. And that's what's responsible, all right, for uh, the dark matter. So it's a composite particle, kind of could be cool. Um, anyway, once you open your mind to all these other possibilities, there's all kinds of massive particles, all right, that, that could be responsible for, for the dark matter. And, you know, it's gonna take us a long time to explore all that, maybe 60 years, who knows. Um, so, and then there are other, there are ways that, that, uh, that nature could just be, could be just be trying to trick us, all right? We even got theories called stealth Susie. So, you know, who, maybe that's what's going on. We don't really know. But there's still a lot of active research on all three search fronts, and I'm confident wimps are the answer. Thank you. Okay, so axions. So I'm gonna tell you about why axions, what are they and how do we detect them? Um, and Kevin gave a great introduction to a lot of things that I can just gloss over now. Um, so before I talk about axions, I'm gonna tell you about a physics problem, which is the strong CP problem. The strong force, CP stands for charge parity, you saw that a moment ago, uh, conservation. And the upshot of this strong CP problem is that the neutron should have an electric dipole moment, okay, it's a composite particle, and it doesn't. So what's expected is there's, there should be an electric dipole moment, so a distribution of charges in the neutron, uh, and it's mediated by this angle, theta bar, okay, and theta bar should be between, say, zero and two pi, so it's roughly order one. What's been measured, though, is 10 orders of magnitude down from that expected dipole value. Okay, which constrains this theta bar, this angle, to be less than 10 to the minus 10 radians. That's tiny. Okay, so the neutron shows no electric dipole moment. This is the part of the strong CP problem. And that theta bar is the CP violating angle. So that violating angle uh, is less than, in astronomer parlance, less than 20 micro arc seconds. So extremely close to zero. And usually, in astronomy anyway, when we see something that's very close to zero, like the flatness of the universe, it's probably zero. There's probably a reason, okay? This is the strong CP problem. Enter the axion. So the axion is a hypothetical elementary particle that promises to clean up your strong CP problem. 
and it was proposed by Pecci and Quinn. They came up with a mechanism where there's a field that naturally drives that angle to zero, okay, a symmetry breaking, and associated with that is a particle called the axion, a very light particle. Uh, and it was actually named after a laundry detergent at the time because it cleans up the strong CP problem. Um, and what I want to highlight here are a few things. One, it's an alternative to WIMPs. That's why I'm here. Uh, but it's also a great dark matter candidate. Okay, so it was created this idea of an axion to solve this problem in physics and QCD. However, if it solves that problem, if that's the answer, it should be produced copiously in the early universe by a similar mechanism that Kevin just described. So in the early universe, it's hot, things get made. Then we freeze out, we get out of equilibrium, and the axions are left behind from the early universe. And in fact, it turns out they should be enough of them to account for dark matter. Um, they are uh, chargeless and no spin, so they're bosons. And, but what's interesting about axions also is they, in fact, interact electromagnetically. Okay, so it's not like a weakly interacting particle. Uh, they just interact, uh, their interaction with photons is very, very weak. But by weak, I don't mean weak force. I mean it is weak, okay? Uh, so the weakness is indicated by this coupling between uh, axions and photons, this little g, g, a, gamma, gamma. Okay, and I'm showing two diagrams here for how axions interact with light. That G number is tiny, okay, and that's why we don't easily detect axions. But I'm going to show you two ways to get at this. Uh, so the main way that folks have realized that axions may interact is they can, in the presence of a strong magnetic field, convert into photons and vice versa. And if there's interest during the q and I can tell you about this great experiment where people are staring at a wall. Okay. But so if we can convert axions into photons in the presence of a magnetic field, enter the halo scope. We heard about dark matter halos. So the halo is this thing that's surrounding the galaxy. Scope as in telescope. So people are building halo scopes to detect the dark matter halo. And if we have a strong magnetic field coming through a cavity and the cavity is tuned to the right size, that axion can create a resonance, convert into photon, and you see some power. And that power is the axion mass. And the power out of the halo scopes depends on that coupling between axions and photons, G, the volume of your detector, which you want a big detector if you can, the strength of the magnetic field, but also the density of dark matter that's sleeting through this detector. Okay? And so when people build these things in the lab, they're stuck with the dark matter that we have, not the dark matter we'd want. Okay, so we're stuck with the density of dark matter in this neck of the woods, in this part of the galaxy. Okay, but that's how we would detect uh, dark matter with a haloscope. And here's what axion searches look like. So that coupling is on the vertical axis. The mass of the axion is on the horizontal axis. And you'll see there are a lot of orders of magnitude here. The orange locus is theory. So theory predicts a relationship between how well axions couple with photons and their mass, but it has no prediction for the mass. Okay, so the mass is completely unconstrained. So what we want to do is exclude parts of this parameter space, and you'll see lots of filled in areas. These are areas where people have excluded axions and that combination of mass and coupling. And, but you'll notice that a lot of these don't cross theory. They don't reach the theoretical value. Remember that G value is very small. Um, but you will see some of these very narrow loci here Okay, that are coming down and touching the theory line. And so these are haloscopes. So built in the labs all over the country, or the world, um, these haloscopes are sort of reaching the levels they need to see axions if the axions are in those narrow mass ranges. Okay, so that's how haloscopes work. And the plan is to just expand this region that we're excluding in that theory locus. Okay? All right, so that's haloscopes. I'm going to talk to you about a natural haloscope now. So imagine that I want a really big detector. What do I want? I want big magnetic field, big volume, and I want more dark matter than we get here on Earth. I want to find a place with more dark matter, a higher density. Okay, so there are natural haloscopes out there. This is an artist's depiction of a magnetar. It's a highly magnetized pulsar or neutron star. So it's got a ridiculous magnetic field. Okay, so there's that. That magnetic field threads a much larger volume than you can ever create in the lab here on Earth. Okay, so we get a big volume. What we can also do is find a magnetar near the center of our galaxy where the dark matter density is much, much higher. Okay, this is the 
little bright spot there is Sagittarius A star. That's the black hole in the center of our galaxy, the massive black hole. And a very small distance away from it is a magnetar. So it's sitting there in this big bath of dark matter. Its magnetic field is ridiculous. Sorry, astronomers use Gauss, not Tesla. Uh, but it also spans a big volume. So we have this natural halo scope. So I can take spectra of the magnetar and look for that increase in power that's telling me that it is converting axions into light. Okay? So we do the same sort of thing to search for axions. Um, so once again, this is mass on the x-axis and that coupling on the vertical axis. And you see the orange band, which is a theory. So we're trying to reach that theory level. I'm also including on here one of the halo scopes. It's called Haystack. Folks here work on Haystack. So I'm showing that the halo scopes are actually more sensitive, okay, but they're narrow band. Whereas when we search magnetars for these signals, we can search for the broad band regions. So it's very complementary. All right, the last thing I want to excite you about with axions is you can make an axion laser or an axion maser. So the other, so axions, remember, can be converted into uh, photons through magnetic fields, but they actually also have a two photon decay channel. Okay? It's just that their lifetime is incredibly long, longer than the age of the universe. But they do decay. Okay? And what's really neat about this is that I can actually stimulate decay. So if I have a photon of the right energy that comes along, just like stimulated emission, okay, I can stimulate decay. And galaxies are actually very good at making photons in the right range. So galaxies should actually be stimulating their own decay of their dark matter halos. So there, I've got a huge volume. Okay, basically, all of the dark matter in a halo can be converted into light at some very low level. And so what we can do is look at spectra of galaxies, entire galaxies. So there's the biggest volume you can think of, okay, and to see that sort of axion decay. And we can do that, say, for a few galaxies, or maybe 100 galaxies, or thousands, or millions of galaxies. And eventually, we will be stacking up spectra of millions of galaxies to see this sort of natural axion maser. Um, so I'm showing you some projections here. This is, once again, this uh, coupling constant versus axion mass. So we can do this with entire galaxies. So we can use the entire dark matter halos to look for this signal. All right, so axions. Why do I like axions? They address a fundamental problem with the standard model. If that solution is correct, they should be also be dark matter, which to me is very motivational. I like things that are solve one problem but happen to solve other problems for us, so they're not invented as the dark matter particle. Right. Um, nature offers many ways to detect that dark matter particle. What I love about this is if I go out and see something really interesting with a telescope, I can come to a basement somewhere and say, hey, look at this exact mass range or frequency, and vice versa. So if something's detected in the lab, we can go and point telescopes at something completely different okay, and confirm that detection of the axion. Cool, I've got 16 seconds. <laughs> anyway, axions. All right, thank you so much. So we have our opening statements. We have our, our two candidates. We have the weaker than weakly interacting particle, or we have the laundry detergent particle. <laughs> so we're going to uh, let me ask uh, both of our uh, speakers to come up to the front here. So we're going to have uh, brief rebuttals now, uh, and then we're going to throw it to you for some audience questions. So uh, very briefly, I think we'll just uh, I'll sort of ask this you know, from the perspective of the person in the audience who has heard your opening statements. They haven't made up their mind yet which way they're going to vote. So we'll start with you, Kevin. Uh, what would you say to convince that person they should vote for WIMPs? <laughs> um, let's see. I don't know. Billions of dollars can't be wrong? No, that doesn't sound good. Um, <laughs> I, I don't know. Uh, hmm. Let's see. OK, try to be serious. Uh, let's see. Uh, yeah, I mean, so uh, OK, so I, I did like um, Jeremy's point about um, uh, you know, solving more than one problem. And, and so that was you know, what really drew me originally to supersymmetry, that you know, it, it really, you know, really seemed to tie together you know, several different problems with the standard model. Like, we could solve it all in one go. Um, but we could solve dark matter. We could solve the hierarchy problem. And we could maybe, you know, make make what make our way towards grand unified theory. So that that part is 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 great. Um, now that 
and I, you know, and supersymmetry may still exist, but unfortunately it's looking less likely and it's looking, it's not doing as good a job as we would have hoped in solving the hierarchy problem. So, um, you know, the sort of expansion of, of wimpness to be, you know, any sort of massive particle with the, with the force that we make up um, is less compelling, I would, I would, I would agree. Um, but, you know, it could be cooler. I mean, uh, you know, <laughs> I mean, who, 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 I mean, who's gonna argue with dark neutrons, all right? I mean, that, that sounds pretty cool, right? Um, and so, you know, if it's true, it could expand, you know, a whole new frontier in what we could look for, rather than just solving one itty bitty problem. So, all right, that's my rebuttal. <laughs> oh, and also, I, I, th I thought axions were ruled out like 30 years ago. Are these, are these like axion-like, th I mean, uh, in, in Ethan's cartoon, there was only a really narrow mass range. I thought that the traditional strong CP solving axion existed, but again, I, I'm, I don't, I'm, just, I'm just throwing doubt here. I don't know <laughs> what I've heard. All right, would you care to respond to that in particular? Uh, to the axion comment, yeah. So there is a sort of a preferred range for axions, and that's the range these telescopes are tuning to. Uh, it's, but once again, it's, there are sort of these indirect arguments people make. So if it's dark matter, then it probably has to be in a narrower range than uh, people are searching. Uh, so there's unfortunately a whole class, speaking of making things up, of axion-like particles that people love. Uh, and that do all sorts of crazy things around black holes. I don't, I don't buy any of that stuff. Um, and I'm not sure that I'm making a good argument here. But um, so I guess, can I ask a question? Yes. Okay. So I had heard uh, some decades ago uh, that the latest particle accelerators would be WIMP fact or dark matter factories, basically making WIMPs. And what happened to that? <laughs> You know we aren't. Yeah, <laughs> uh, yeah no, I mean, uh, you know, we, we have, uh, yeah, I mean, this is always the case. You know, theorists are going to love to predict something that is just across the line, right? Oh, if we just build this thing, then we'll find it, right? We don't find it. Somehow the theorists said, oh, we should have realized that all along. And, oh, here's another theory that's just over here. Um, so. You know, I don't know. I mean, we all have our own motivations, um, but yeah, it doesn't. And honestly, we, we all thought that we would find supersymmetry. Well, I thought. I shouldn't say we all. I thought we'd find supersymmetry before we found the Higgs. I mean, that was that was my thought going in. Turns out not to be the case. But uh, yeah, all right. <laughs> <laughs> just just give us another another accelerator. I'm sure we'll find it then. <laughs> Anything else you'd like to add for, uh, the, uh, to convince the audience member who might uh, be on the fence? Oh, yes, why axions? Yeah, so I said it before, but I, I okay, so uh, like Tyler, I was very upset about five years ago about especially astronomers' inability to detect dark matter and to figure it out. Okay, we've been characterizing it, measuring its mass and where it is and how much there is for ages, decades. And then I feel like astronomers just dropped the ball and said, all right, well, physicists will figure out what the particle is now that we know it's a particle, right? And that just made me furious. And so I came at this problem pretty recently asking, all right, we've got this huge menu of possible dark matter candidates. So it's sort of asking the question of this debate, what is the best one? I, I need to, I'm going to work on this. What, what should I work on, right? And for me, axions were the best motivated, and it's because of this other physics problem that's, that's being trying to solve, uh, and the, in fact, the, the prediction for axions is almost 50 years old now, 1977. Uh, I feel it stood the test of time nicely. Some people say it's because you can't detect it. So of course, it's a theorist's dream. It's going to stick around forever because you can never find it, right? To be a good theorist, you bury everything where nobody can find it, right? But. Um, but to me, that was very motivational. Okay, I've got other reasons for axions to exist. They're coincidentally dark matter, which is great. It's sort of like the Wimp miracle, though, I will say. Um, so that's what really motivated me to, to go after this particular thing. Um, and also, I really like that we can see it in the sky as well as in the laboratory if it is the correct answer. So we'll have really nice validation. All right. <laughs> well, I think in the interest of time, uh, 
it will go directly into the audience Q&A. So uh, let me take a few questions from the audience, please. I think it's entirely the mass. I mean, yeah, the, the, the WIMPs are, are definitely very massive. I mean, yeah, massive. I mean, not, not on the order of like a mosquito, but you know, they're massive, uh, massive particles that, that are cold, dark matter um, until they freeze out at a, at a certain time. Right. Yeah, and the, axions are micro electron volts in that neighborhood. So far, far, far less than the mass of an electron. <laughs> so, uh, it sounds like both WIMPs and axions have some interplay with other physics, WIMPs with supersymmetry and axions with a strong CP problem. If one of them was to be like the way that dark matter is, like what dark matter is, how would you, how, is there a way to reconcile like the other physics that would be lost in, with the description of the other particles that you've thrown out? Um, no, they're solving different problems, really. I mean, uh, I mean, yeah, supersymmetry is is solving its problems. You know, axions are solving a, a different problem. So you, you're still are faced if you know if if dark matter is axions, then you're still faced with uh, understanding the Higgs mass and understanding, yeah, understanding why the Higgs mass is what it is. So you still have some problems on that side. And if it's if they're wimps, you still have the strong C, CP problem. They can't one can't solve the other one, I guess. It's, I guess I'd right. say that turning it the other way around, so suppose that we somehow figure out dark matter is not axions, right? Um, there is some wiggle room there for it to still solve the strong CP problem, maybe if it's produced before inflation or something. Uh, there are ways you can make the axions so that, or maybe they're only a tenth of the dark matter. You know, so there are lots of ways that we could, that they could still say solve the strong, strong CP problem but not be the dominant component of dark matter. And it's, it is interesting though, because the, the problem that I mentioned, the hierarchy problem, or the why the Higgs mass is so light, and the strong CP problem are both examples, Ethan can correct me if I'm wrong, of, of fine tuning, right? So, I mean, you could just say the universe is fine tuned for whatever reason, and then there are no more problems. You just say, for whatever reason, instead of choosing something around one, it chooses 10 to the minus 10, or whatever, you know. And, and, and so, uh, yeah, so they're only problems in, you know, one sense. They're not like super critical problems, I would say. They're, they're sort of theorist problems. They're theorist problems, yeah. <laughs> theorists don't yes. like, to, like it when they don't understand why a number is, isn't one, instead it's 10 to the minus 10. That seems unnatural. Yeah. We, we hate it. <laughs> we have a real problem that we're debating, though, which is what is dark matter? That's, right. that's a mean, real problem. Dark matter problem. actually exists. That. That's a, that is a real problem. Yeah. We have to solve that one. Let me, let me ask, just to shake things up a little, any questions specifically about uh, WIMPs or axions? So for one of our two. <laughs> uh, yeah. Oh, so that if I find a photon at a specific energy, that is the axion mass. It's just E equals mc squared. Oh. Yep. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Uh, I'm very big, uh, strong believers of supersymmetry because I felt the mass is really amazing and gorgeous. But uh, I, my question is that uh, if, as what Professor Darling said, that uh, uh, it was actually would be solving a, a, a specific, uh, <coughs> a, 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 I guess, a electric dipole moment question within the neutron. Then my question is, I felt that, uh, as well, uh, I've been said, that the dark matter is strongly uh, coupling with the physical mass that's in present of the visible universe. Then uh, I assume that how would, first of all, how would axiom uh, 
acting on the mass that was being observed uh, in very, the very first pictures of the axiom, uh, I'm sorry, the dark matter being in, in the uh, in clashing of the nebula. And the second question is, uh, if that was the case, then can we, uh, my, in my head, I would imagine it would be something like, uh, what we'll be describing the, something like the rel uh, general relativity, be like a, like a bed or uh, uh, the plane of the, uh, the sea water that would be colliding, that would, so those two will be, all, the, the dark matter will almost be like waves that's carrying the physical universe that we, that we have right now. So uh, I'm not sure if that uh, is what the WIMPs concept, and so that's my second question. So first, how would, if that the uh, uh, axiom would, that the goal of the axiom is to solve the coupling of uh, the, the, sorry, solve the CP problem, then how would, would be coupling with the mass? And second question is that uh, if that model of what I'm thinking would would, would that was uh, it's what the wimp is telling us, and that's the, yeah that's the questions that I have. I, I'm not sure I got so, that. I, I, they, one question I've had about axions, I mean, I, you know, so cold dark matter is usually understood as being massive, and axions are light, so. I think there's some trick, right, that they freeze out and yet are non-relativistic or somehow clumped together, or maybe that. Yeah, and yes, that's, that's uh, tricky that they're light but non-relativistic, so cold. Um, and there's a mechanism by which uh, when they do freeze out, they stay cold. Uh, I can't claim to understand it completely. Uh, but they do uh, uh, basically act as a, a cold particle um, which is hard, I think it's tricky to do because a cold particle, you would think if it's a very low mass, it doesn't need much energy to be hot, right? Uh, so I think that is one issue with the axion as dark matter idea, um, but smarter folks than myself feel like it's a, a solved problem in terms of making it cold. All right, maybe a couple more questions. A couple more questions, yeah. So this is specifically about WIMPs. Um, I guess the, um, so, you know, we're saying, okay, well, maybe the WIMPs aren't interacting via the weak force. Maybe it's via some currently unknown force. So that leaves um, two possibilities in my mind. One of them is that this force doesn't interact with ordinary matter at all, in which case literally these things may as well are about as perfectly dark matter as you can imagine, and there's no point really whatsoever in trying to um, sy to synthesize them at all, and they'll just be forever an enigma. Or else that other force, which has to have a cross-section that you've argued similar to the weak force, seems like there's a good chance we would have detected that already, given how long we've had, um, we've been, or we've, if it did interact with uh, ordinary matter. And I guess I'm, what I'm, what I would say is, how, how realistic is it that there's another force out there with a or similar strength to the weak force that we haven't detected? So yeah, good, good, good questions, and, and you're absolutely right. And, and this is also part of the whole, um, you know, the, there's this, you know, particle physics. Well, we, we want to look for things that we can find, right? So you're absolutely right. If we just assume that dark matter only interacts gravitationally and absolutely nothing else, we are so screwed, <laughs> right? So we, we try, we try to, we, we try to think, we try to avoid that possibility. We just put that out of our minds because. What would be the point, all right? If you can't find something, you know, you, you gotta keep looking, right? So we just put that out of our minds. So it has to interact in, in some way, whether it's an axion or, or a wimp. Um, and yeah, and basically all these limits have pushed things down and so that, you know, the cross sections are now much less than, say, the weak interaction. And so you, people, you'll, you'll hear all kinds of talk about like the dark sector. So there'll be dark sector something or another. And then there has to be some way that it connects to what we see, all right, connects to the standard model. So there's some mediator between them, which is obviously gonna be very small. The coupling will be very small because you're right, we would have seen it already if it weren't. And so you can just, you just make it small because, you know, well, let's see, what have we ruled out? Let's make it a little smaller than that. So that's where we're at. Um, and if we rule out more, we'll just make it smaller than that. So you, you, can, still, you can still do it. So I would just say in Axion's favor, uh, <laughs> we're not in that situation where, oh, it just must be, you know, a lower interaction. There's actually a theoretical prediction. So once you reach that theory or a little below it, you can exclude that Axion mass range, which is really nice. And it's sort of unusual that we actually have a floor to search to, to get to. 
Yeah, but if you make the mass light enough, that floor is you'll you oh, can yeah, never yeah. never never reach it, right? That's right. It's yeah. kind of like seeing, you know, relic neutrinos or something. I don't think we're ever going to see those either. Really? Okay, um, the Big Bang Theory was mentioned as the creation point potentially for WIMPs and axions. Is there anything within this extensively explored theory that may support or disprove either of these particles to be created there? The nice thing about the Big Bang is that if you want a certain temperature, you just go to the right time, <laughs> right? It just you know gets arbitrarily hot and dense as you go back. So you you know pick your favorite particle. Oh, okay, it is made in sort of e in equilibrium at that time or at that temperature. Um, so it's it's sort of like you know if you think a particle is made uh, and will stick around and not decay after. It, uh, freezes out okay, from whatever's going on at that time, and it should be around. So it's really nice that you know, if you have a particle that you have a way to make it early on and it doesn't decay, it should just still be here, right? But, but if you extend the Big Bang out to, say, a couple hundred thousand years, I mean, there's all kinds of information that's already been incorporated, all right? Big Bang nucleosynthesis, um, you know, this, the information we get from the CMB, all that sort of stuff is already there. It's already baked in, I think. So I don't think that there's... And so, and so these theories have already been, you know, been configured to uh, to work within the, those uh, those limits. And you saw, like, on some of the exclusion plots, there would be limits coming from astronomical observations that, you know, that that exclude certain things. All right. Well, I think uh, in the interest of time, we should uh, wrap things up. So we have two compelling candidates, but there can only be one winner. So. Uh, let me turn it back over to Tyler to wrap things up. Right, yeah, so you all have two minutes to answer and submit the form, and then uh, if you have a paper copy, then you can come up, uh, bring it to the front here, and we'll input those um, and include those in the count. But yeah, so again, uh, scan the QR code. If you weren't around for the beginning, uh, we answered the question once based on what we thought dark matter was at the beginning. Now we're going to answer that question one more time. And while you guys are submitting that form. Oh, yeah, 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 for sure. For sure. Yeah. Okay. Uh, yeah? Hey, you can tell them too. If they want to come down and chat with us, mm, we'll, be, sure, we'll sure. be here after they've submitted their call. Okay. Ah, the results are already coming in. All right, I do think from these results, it is pretty definitive that we do have a winner. So let us give a big hand for our winner, Professor Jeremy Darling with Axions. <laughs>